Okay, hi everyone. This is going to be the first lecture on chapter 20. We're looking at partnerships here. Now, when we talk about partnerships, the first thing you have to be aware of is that there's flow through taxation. And what we mean by that is the entity itself, namely the partnership, generally is not gonna pay tax. So for example, if we had a partnership that made $100,000 of ordinary business income, and there were four partners, the partnership as an entity doesn't pay tax on $100,000. Instead, what they do is uh, issue a K-1 to each of those four shareholders, and hey, maybe they would claim $25,000 on each of their individual returns. So the tax is at the owner level, one layer of taxation. Here's some kind of characteristics about partnerships. You can look through those. What are we looking at at a high level here with the chapter? Well, essentially, right, if we were to kind of map this to say where are we at, where are we going, we're gonna be looking at you know high level formation, operations, distributions, and sale of a partnership. And this slide specifically is looking at all of this from the partner's point of view. We also will be looking at the partnership's point of view, things like inside basis, but let's just do a quick rundown of this from the partner's point of view. And again, we're going to unpack this uh, step by step with more detail, but it's better to just kind of like orient you here versus jumping right into it. So starting with formation, right? There's a couple of different ways you can acquire your partnership interest. One is you can just straight up uh, pay cash. The other is you can give property. Uh, the third way is you can provide services. As a general rule, right, and we'll see kind of the specifics with it, but as a general rule, there's going to be no gain or loss on the contribution of property, uh, namely a disposition event, amount realized minus adjusted basis for a partnership interest, right? So in this case, if they're giving up their machine for the partnership interest, it's like they just sold their machine, right? It's like they just sold it for cash, except instead of getting cash, they uh, you know, get a partnership interest. So technically that's a disposition event. Technically they should figure out what their gain was. Um, now we'll talk about this, but the idea he here is uh, we don't pay tax on it here, right? That gain or loss, we're going to kick the can, defer it until later on um, whenever the partnership itself sells it, okay? And in this way, at least with formation, we have to be aware of our initial outside basis. So we'll start and talk about that as we go through here, but let's talk a little bit about operations, right? So the idea with this is as the partnership makes money, Right, so their ordinary business income goes up. It's the reverse for like you know expenses, losses, but it's easier just to teach it one way. Uh, the idea with this is the partner's basis is going to go up. Okay, so it's kind of like we start with our initial basis over here, right? And that's just basically saying, hey, can you please tell me your basis from this guy's point of view, the partner's point of view in that interest? So we start with it, then we start to adjust it as the partnership makes money, right? And again, as the partnership makes money, they're gonna push that K-1 out to us. And we gotta claim that on our individual return. One of the things to be aware of here is you may get you know, a K-1 that shows 50 grand of income on it and you didn't actually get paid a, penalty, a penny of that. You still need to claim that and pay tax on it even though uh, you didn't get a dollar out of it, like in real cash, okay? It's almost kind of like that equity method of accounting. The flip side of that is, right, if you pay tax on it here as the partnership makes the income and it increases your basis, whenever the partnership actually pushes the distributions out to you, uh, that is going to decrease your basis and as a general rule, to the extent it eats up that basis, it's going to be a non-taxable return of capital. So what's the kind of counterintuitive thing here? Uh, you don't really pay tax whenever you actually get money from the partnership. You actually you know, pay tax when it earns it. It's almost like accrual accounting. All right. 
Um, and then finally here on the back end, we'll see this, be aware that the partnership interest, right? That is a capital asset. And at the end of the day, right, when we come to the end of the road, road and this guy's just like, look, I don't want to be in this partnership anymore and he sells it, uh, that's going to be a disposition event where we have to do our amount realized minus our adjusted basis gives us our gain and loss. And the thing here is, right, the adjusted basis here, uh, that is this guy right here that we keep seeing throughout. So that's why we got to keep tracking it and tracking it because at the end of the day, when we go and sell this thing, right, yeah, we it's easy to know, right, hey, we sold it for a thousand bucks, but what's our basis in this guy right here? If we don't know that, we can't figure out our gain or loss. Okay, so just high level here, when we talk about partnerships, the IRS has kind of taken two viewpoints on them whenever they you know, construct partnership tax law. They have the entity approach and the aggregate approach. And the entity approach basically treats the partnership as an entity separate from the partners, whereas the aggregate approach treats the partnership as an aggregate of the partnership interest, right? So it's kind of like the entity approach would be looking at the partnership as the wheel, right? Sorry, that's a lopsided wheel. Uh, whereas the aggregate approach would be looking at all of their interests, right? It's like a collection of interests. And again, they, they use both of these approaches when they uh, design and craft the tax law, but just be aware of that as we go through. All right, so let's talk about partnership formation, right? So we're kind of at the beginning here. We got the baby up here in the, in the beginning, right? So we're at the start. Uh, we said there's a few different ways you can acquire your partnership interest. You can buy it with cash. You can give property or you can give services, right? What you're getting whenever you contribute these items is your partnership interest. And when we talk about a partnership interest, it's really divided into two components. That is to say there's a capital interest and a profit interest. Most of the time you're gonna get both. However, it is possible to bifurcate them. You could just get a capital interest. You could just get a profit interest. What do these mean though, right? Well, a capital interest basically is saying and recognizing that you're like an equity owner. So if something bad happens, if this business goes, goes down, we're out of business, we're starting to liquidate, sell our stuff, you with your capital interest can say, hey, I have uh, a share in the proceeds from the sale of that liquidation, right? I'm like an equity owner. In distinction, a profits interest is more kind of like a residual, right? What I mean by that is, yeah, you're not an equity owner per se, where your interest is, uh, is in the profit. So for example, uh, I get 10% of all future profits. The business goes down, I'm not involved with that, right? I'm not an equity owner, but hey, every year they make 100 grand, I get 10 grand of that on a K-1, okay? So that's the idea with that. And we're gonna see that this comes into play and it's important, especially for service partners, right? Because there's gonna be different tax uh, consequences for individuals who contribute services for their partnership interests. Now, as a general rule, right, when we're talking about partnership formation, right, uh, the legal standard is two people who come together uh, to make money for a profit. You don't really have to file anything with the state per se. Uh, normally, what you will have is a partnership operating agreement. That's like really important because like in practice, Right? You're going to want to look at that. You, you're going to like see that actually in real life, legal documents for it. We'll talk about that when we talk about profit and loss allocation. But as a beginning and general rule here, right, we said that it's going to be tax deferred when you contribute property for your partnership interest. And essentially what's going on here, right? So you have, here's you right? You're giving the property, maybe your machine, right? And they're giving you the partnership interest, which we said is, you know, kind of divided into two components, right? The idea with this is, uh, yes, you have a disposition event. It's going to be the amount realized minus the adjusted basis. 
gives you your gain or loss, that's your realized gain or loss. You recognize zero dollars right now. Instead, what you do, right, is you kind of kick the can, right? It's like later, right? Whenever my little nephew doesn't want to do anything, right? It's like a nice way for him <laughs> saying uh, no is like, hey, Connor, do you want to read today or do you, you want to do this? And it's like later, right? Uh, so that's the idea here is, yeah, we have a gain or loss, but we're going to recognize it later, okay? And we'll talk about when that is, whenever the partnership sells it. What's the idea here? Uh, well, if you had to pay tax anytime you formed a partnership, you know, for contributing property, nobody's going to form a partnership, right? It's like, yeah, I got, we want to open a pizza shop and I got a building or I got this and you're going to tax me for you know, trying to run a business. It's like not really good uh, economic policy there. So the idea with this is, um, you know, Generally, you're going to have deferral on it. So let's look at 21 here to kind of show some facts. Um, all right. Looks like we got a partnership and somebody contributes land. Okay, so there's property. It's got a fair market value of 120, an adjusted basis of 20. Right. So what that means is there's a built-in gain of 100,000. They contribute it. Uh, technically, they have a $100,000 gain here. But because we have those deferral rules, the later rules, uh, we're going to kick the can on it. Right now, zero dollars we recognize. Same facts if we change it up and there's a built-in loss, right? You're going to get the same outcome here. But this little note says, and it basically applies basic tax strategy, uh, namely you want to accelerate expenses and losses and defer uh, income and gains. This basically says, hey, yeah, you can do this. You can contribute the property um, and you know have zero dollars recognized right now, but you're going to defer later that loss, and that's not really a good tax uh, tax planning strategy. You would be better off in this situation if you just independently sold the land, take the loss, right? Do the loss now, and then the money that you get from selling it throw that into the partnership, right? That would be like a better kind of more savvy thing to do. Okay, now one of the things when we're talking about basis uh, is there's two types. There's outside basis and inside basis, right? So when we're talking about outside basis, we're really looking from the partner's point of view. And what we mean by this is what is your basis in your partnership interest. In distinction, when we look at inside basis, we're really looking at the partnership's point of view. What, from the partnership's point of view, uh, is their basis in the property they have that was contributed? Now, we said, why do we care about basis, right? This is another way right here of saying adjusted basis. And when we talk about outside basis, also just to be kind of clear with you, there's initial kind of what we start with. And then as the uh, business earns money, right, there's all these kind of operations, you're going to have your adjusted outside basis. Another term for this is tax basis, right, as if it isn't confusing enough, right? So all of these things Right, it's kind of like um, Khaleesi from Game of Thrones, right? She's like breaker of dragons, storm girl, whatever, you know, dragon lady, right? She has like five names, but it all means the same thing. Sort of similar thing here in tax, right? And you always have to be careful with your words. But if you see all of these things, we're referring to the same item there. And we care about this outside basis for two reasons. One, right, we've already talked about this. When this guy sells his interest, we need to know our amount realized minus adjusted basis. And two, uh, and we'll talk about this in the next lecture, uh, that basis is going to come into play whenever you're trying to deduct passive activity losses. Okay, now the next thing to be aware of here is when we have that property for stock, right, uh, contribution over here, 
the idea here is that both the partner and the partnership are going to take a carryover basis, right, in their uh, outside and inside basis, respectively. So let's look at 22 to show this here, what's going on. All right, looks like we got somebody, they contribute cash, 120 uh, for their interest. They wanna know what's their outside basis. Well, it's gonna be 120. Then they say, okay, they contribute land for their partnership interest. Uh, hey, that partner, right, the guy who contributed, he paid his adjusted basis in that land is $20,000, right? You want to ignore this guy right here and focus on the adjusted basis. The idea with this is it carries over and now becomes his outside basis, right? So what's going on here? We got a guy, right? A partnership and a partner. Here's, I don't know, my machine, right? Whatever, that's some kind of machine and here's the partnership interest. His basis in that machine was $20,000, okay? That's his adjusted basis. If afterwards I go up to him and I say, hey, you know, Mr. Partner, can you please tell me what your basis is in your interest, what you got? Well, now it's gonna be $20,000. It carries over. Likewise, if I go up to the partnership Right, and I say, hey, you know, uh, partner, uh, ship, can you please tell me what is your basis in this machine? Right, well, it's also gonna be 20, right? So that's the idea. It's like outside basis carries over, inside basis carries over. The idea with this is by virtue of carrying over the basis, remember how we talked about you defer the gain until later? Right, so you're basically just continuing that basis such that when you sell it, the built-in gain will later be recognized for the same amount, okay? So, there's a little slide you can look at. So let me pull this up here. All right, so this is gonna be an important slide for you, right? We're talking about initial outside basis. And we said you can give property, you can give money, or you can give services. As a starting point, right, we talked a little bit about giving money, whatever you paid is your basis. We talked about um, giving property, whatever your basis in that machine was, right, 20 is now going to be your basis in the partnership interest. And I don't know, let's just say we paid 60 here for that. Okay, this is the starting point. Now we're gonna build it out a little bit, right? Because there's you know, more to this here. Let's start with the idea of the first adjustment we're gonna make, right? And this says, whenever the partnership as an entity has debt, there's additional step for that basis. In other words, each partner must include their share of partnership debt as part of their outside basis, right? You can read it there, but essentially the tax law requires you to do this. So the first thing you got to do here is add, right? This is for all three here, your percentage of the partnership debt. So let's look at an example here. So that's a lot of words there. Let's kind of summarize this quickly. So we got a partnership that has 60 grand, right? And there's three partners and they're basically saying, hey, we're gonna allocate this evenly between us, right? One third each guarantee. If we got a guy who gave 120 cash Right? The idea with this is now we're going to have to add to his basis the one third, right? Because when you got 60 grand, right? If you got three people, it's going to be 20, 20, 20. 
that's going to increase his basis. All right, so that's the first adjustment we looked at, right? So I don't know, here let's just say it was five bucks. All right, maybe there was a $15,000 uh, debt the partnership has and there's three partners, they're gonna break it up evenly between them. Uh, we, we increase it there. Now, when you're talking about debt, you gotta be aware of there's two types. There's recourse debt versus non recourse debt. And the difference here is whether you're personally liable, right? Recourse debt. If the partnership doesn't pay that $60,000, they can come to you, Mr. Partner's house or Mrs. Partner's house and come and take your car, come and take your house. In distinction, non recourse debt is basically secured property, right? There's collateral in play. By way of example, if you have a business partnership, hey, we're going to get a pizza van because we're creating a pizza company and the dealer says, all right, uh, this is the van is collateral, right? So what happens here is the partnership goes down. You don't pay the, the van. The best they can get is come and take the van, right? They can't come to your house and you know, take your, uh, you know, your savings account, and all this stuff. It's basically um, they, they can't reach you directly there. So that's non recourse debt. Um, the idea with non-recourse debt, it comes into play a couple different areas. So see like the next lecture when we talk about passive activity loss rules and the at-risk basis. So uh, you do need to keep these types of debts separate in your head. One of the things here, and this is the next adjustment, right? So we looked at the first adjustment. Now let's look at the second adjustment. This says, all right, if we have a partner that contributes property subject to a debt, uh, we are going to treat this as debt relief as a deemed cash distribution that reduces outside basis. So what does this mean, right? So first off, here's where we're going with it when we look at it. And specifically what they're saying here is if you contribute property, right, that has a debt attached to it, uh, the idea with that is if the partnership takes on that debt, it's like you're off the hook, right? It's like you just got something. It's not that much different if the property pushed out cash to you. By way of example, right? Say you graduate, you have 30 grand of student loans. And I say, hey, I'm just going to pay that for you, right? Um, you know, I'll send the check into the company. The idea here is like, I didn't really directly give you something, right? I didn't give you like cash in your hand, uh, but you still got something, right? You're like happy about it. Uh, it's kind of the same thing here. Right, say that we were to give this machine, right? Uh, or say that we were giving a house, right? And the house had a mortgage attached to it. Uh, and the partnership's just like, look, we, we want the house. We're gonna do our operations there. We will take on that mortgage. So the idea with this is you just received something. It's like a distribution. We, we talk about distributions, right? We will see that that reduces your basis. So to the extent there's liability relief, you have to decrease your basis. Now, one of the things here that you should be aware of is that if the debt relief on the property exceeds the adjusted basis, then you'll have a capital gain. In other words, we said the general rule, right? Remember we said no gain or loss, kick the can, defer the gain. The exception here uh, is whenever you contribute property subject to a debt, a mortgage, you know, something like that, and the debt exceeds the adjusted basis in the property, right? So let's look at 25 here to show what's going on. All right, looks like we've got a partner here in a partnership. There's some debt, a bank loan. Oh, there's a mortgage that they're taking on, right? So what's going on here is they contribute land. So that's gonna be a carryover basis. They contribute some cash. Uh, they're not on the hook for any of the debt because of the kind of how it's personally guaranteed. But on this land, right, they owe a mortgage of uh, $40,000. So the idea with this is when you run the numbers, right, you now have 
uh, specifically debt relief, the mortgage of 40 grand exceeds the adjusted basis, uh, this causes, when we run the numbers, your basis uh, nominally to go below zero, right? So here, to the extent your basis went below zero, uh, you will have a capital gain, right? That's treated as a capital gain. The idea is you kind of got more than you gave, right? It's like, well, yeah, I paid 20 for this, but you're getting rid of a $40,000 mortgage on it. So it's like, I'm winning in this contribution. Uh, so it, it is like you receive something, so you have a capital gain. One thing to be aware of here, though, is that, yes, while the calculated basis went below zero, actual basis, right, well, anytime we're talking about outside basis, can never go below zero. So uh, just be aware of that. All right, so this just says, uh, hey, a partnership interest is a capital asset. And as such, uh, you're going to have to look to the holding period for it to determine whether when you sell it, if it's long term or short term. But here's kind of the interesting thing on it, right? So say we got the partner, they contribute uh, the machine, right, for their partnership interest um, from the partnership. Say one week later, right? After doing this, they sell their partnership. So you may look at this and you may say, hey, they only held it a week. That's going to be a short-term capital gain. Here's kind of the thing you don't know, or what you know what this is saying here is if you contribute capital assets or 1231 assets, right? So land or something, uh, that is going to be tacked on to your holding period. Right? So say you held this machine for five years. Right? Accordingly, if you sell this right here, your interest, we are going to treat it as if you held it for five years and one week. Okay, so you can look at that 26 there. If it's other assets, it doesn't meet that. Uh, it's going to begin... You know, here whenever you actually get it. But again, this kind of goes with that idea of carryover, carryover, carryover. You held it for five years before, it's now like we're gonna you know, treat it like you held it for five years from the date you acquired it. You paid 50 bucks for it before, that's now your basis in your partnership interest as well as the partnership's basis in the machine. And we were talking a little bit about that inside basis. Again, we said this is carryover. Um, so whatever your basis is and the property you gave is now the basis that the partnership takes uh, in it. Why we care about that, right, is because it carries over, and we'll see this with uh, special allocations, there's a rule that says whenever the partnership sells that property, right, so say you had it, there was a hundred dollar built-in gain, right? So 120 minus 20 is a hundred, right? So your adjusted basis was 20. The partnership now takes a basis in that of 20. When they go and sell it, right, for 120, it's fair market value, right? Their basis is 20. There's a hundred bucks, right? Here's you over here. It's at the time of contribution later, but later is right here because then they're gonna allocate that back to you, okay? That's like a special rule uh, for you know, built-in gain property. Like the entire gain, it's like a boomerang. It's gonna bounce back to you. Outside of that, like normal operating income is kind of divvied up according to the profit or loss sharing ratio. So maybe like 25% of the gain, 25%. This is a special rule we'll see for built-in gain contributed property. Capital accounts, you can look at that. Just be aware it's an equity account. Uh, you will see that on the K-1 indirectly. Three ways to track it. It's uh, outside basis is like way more important for purposes of uh, our conversation here. All right, so let's talk a little bit here about service partners, right? So we kind of you know talked a little bit about this guy over here. Uh, you know, for if you give property, if you give money, 
how does it work for this guy when you give services? So, right, so we have somebody there like, I don't want to be, um, you know, a partner for money. I don't have any money. I don't have any property I can give you. Can I please do your books and records? Can I please paint the walls, right? Um, can I please, you know, do this, do that? In other words, I'll work for my interests. Well, how does this work, right? So really what you have to look at for this guy is whether he receives a capital interest or a profits interest. Let's start here with the capital interest, right? And if you remember, right, this is basically saying, hey, if things go down, we start liquidating, I get a share of those proceeds. So what this means is if we say, hey, this guy, he's gonna you know, sweep the floor uh, and we're gonna give him a capital interest, the idea is that capital interest will have a liquidation value, right? And we're going to treat that as ordinary income to him. It's basically like he got something right now. He swept the floor. We gave him an equity interest. It's just like if he worked for it, right? So uh, the idea for this is he's going to have income for that amount. And that's what this is saying right here. If it has a liquidation value, namely he gets a capital interest, you need to include to him income uh, and that becomes his basis, the liquidation value, all right? Um, and the other side, the flip side of the coin, so if we said, hey, he has income, well, what about the partnership? What happens here? Well, the partnership's gonna say, hey, if we paid someone to sweep our floor, or we paid an accountant, whatever you know, the service is, uh, we would get a deduction for that. And generally that's what they're going to get, right? They'll be able to deduct it. Um, and the idea with this is whenever they deduct it, they have to allocate it to the non-service partners, right? So say that we had, right, this guy right here, you know, he did the service or whatever he's doing, right? And he has $100 of income, right, from that. What we then do is the partnership gets a hundred dollar deduction. But say that he, right, we have our four partners here. Sorry, I'm running off the page here. And then you have this guy, right? He's the new guy. The idea with this is, yeah, we get a deduction at the partnership level, but we're gonna have to break this out, the 100 bucks, between these guys, right? And maybe it's not 100 bucks, maybe it's, let's just say it's 75 bucks to keep the math simple, right? So what we would do here is you get $25 of a deduction, you get 25, you get 25, right? It's like Oprah here giving out uh, cars to everybody. But that's the idea, right? Because if you think about it, if he got the income, right, you can't really give it back to him because it would in some ways kind of cancel each other out. Not necessarily, but the idea is that's how it works, right? So if we look here at 28, that's what this is showing here. Hey, we have a guy, he has a service partner, right? He has 20 grand of income, right, to him we then have to allocate that between the non-service partners. So the other guys who didn't perform the service. All right, the next thing here, let's talk about if this guy gets a profits interest, right? So he's doing his little service and we say, hey, we're not gonna make you uh, a capital interest, we're gonna give you a profits interest. So when you have a profits interest, that does not have a liquidation value, right? You don't get any of the assets if it starts going under. You essentially here are gonna look uh, to the future, right? Whenever it starts making money, I'm gonna get 10% of that. I'm, you know, it's a future interest in some ways. Uh, so what this means is it's not gonna be taxable to him, no income, right? And if it's no income, right? We gotta take this back. There's not gonna be a liquidation value, right? So that's why I have a little star there, right? It says exclude if only profits interest, but that's the idea, 
with that. Um, in any event, right, whenever we get this new service partner and he gets a partner interest, there's two things we got to adjust, right? There's kind of a domino effect from this. We got to change the profit and loss uh, ratios, and we also have to change the uh, liability allocations, how much each partner uh, is on the hook for here. So let's look at 29. Right, so here's the setup, right? We got a service partner, where's he at in here? Um, a service partner, they're gonna get a profits interest. So we said uh, the sort of upshot of this is this guy, if it's purely profits interest, right? The one who's doing the service, he's gonna have no income. Uh, the partnership's still gonna deduct from their point of view, the value of the services. But what happens here is this guy, right, he's gonna get some of the future profits, right? So if we have three partners, all right, here's the new guy right here. If he gets some of the future profits, then that means these guys, are going to get less, right? It's like if you, you know, there's two people eating a pizza and there's 10 slices, you each get five. If you add a third person to the mix, uh, you get less pizza, right? So uh, don't get too many people in the pizza mix there, right? You, I do like pizza, so I don't like sharing too much of it there, but that's the idea. The first thing is we have to change uh, the profit and loss sharing ratios because we got a new guy who gets some of the profits. Likewise, Right. Remember how we said one of the uh, adjustments to your outside basis is your percentage of the partnership liabilities. Right. So if before the partnership had a hundred thousand that it owed, and there were two partners, right, and they each put fifty in their basis, if we get a new guy, right. The idea with this is, um, you know, he now is going to take on some of this uh, liability, right? So the idea with this is each of their debt allocations, right, goes down and his goes up, right? The new guy over here. So it's basically just kind of like looking at the math of, hey, you start getting a new person eating the pizza. We need to start adjusting things here. Um, so that's the setup with it there. Um, and with that, let me just see where we're, we're going at here. Let's finally just talk here about uh, this last slide, right? So this is just saying, hey, you can buy it, uh, your interest, and this is after formation. So right here, right, this slide, this is saying, at formation, right? Hey, we get four people who come together. We want to open a pizza shop. You can give property. You can give services. You can give cash, right? That's fine. There you go. Six months later, nine months later, right? After formation, right? There's a fifth guy who wants to come. Hey, can I join your pizza shop uh, partnership? That's great. Um, you know, in this way, he can, you know, again, get property or services, uh, you know, for the interest. Um, and alternatively here, uh, he can purchase his partnership interest from an existing partner. In this case, right, the purchaser does not have tax recognition, but still must determine their outside basis. Let's look at 2011 here just to show this. All right, so say we have, you know, three partners, all right? And this guy right here is like, I am not happy. I do not want to be part of this partnership anymore. So I'm going to sell my partnership interest to this guy, right? To the new maker, a lady there, right? That's fine. 
So the question then becomes, what is this lady's outside basis? Right, well, it's essentially going to be what she paid, but then also, right, she's taking on some of the debt, right? So uh, you can look at the math there on it, but that's essentially what it's doing. And then her holding period is going to begin on the day that she bought it, right? So here's kind of a summary, right? You can look at that. This would be a good slide to kind of memorize or have handy. But with that, right, we're going to end the lecture here and we'll pick it up with partnership accounting in the second lecture.